Welcome to the 700 Club. Crippling spending that could destroy this great country, leaving it in shambles for our children and grandchildren. President Biden's three and a half trillion dollar budget plan, led by socialist Bernie Sanders, has passed the Senate. So what now? There's more coming. It can get as high as seven trillion. Here's Gary Lane. Pat, last night, Democrats pushed through the framework for a three huge, three and a half trillion dollar budget. The yeas are 50, the nays are 49, and the concurrent resolution as amended is agreed to. That measure passed on a strictly party line vote. Will all Democrats support it? Well, Republicans were against it. All Democrats supported it. One Republican senator was absent. Democrats and the president say the budget led by Democrat Socialist Bernie Sanders will help families fight climate change and create jobs. Democrats also pledging to pay for it with new taxes and offsets. But the blueprint assumes hundreds of billions in deficits over the next 10 years. Republicans say it will waste money, hurt the economy with high taxes, fuel inflation, and put into place far-left mandates that will hurt Americans. The House will take up the budget plan in two weeks. Pat? Uh, Gary, uh, is there anything can be done to stop this thing? Uh, I, mean, I know Lindsey Graham apparently has COVID and he wasn't there to vote, but what do you think? Pat, it doesn't matter if Lindsey Graham is there or not because the Democrats have the votes. Now, the only one that may stand in the way of that is Senator Manchin of West Virginia. He already has raised some concerns about this massive spending. Uh, but when push comes to shove, it always seems like the Democrats come through and stick together as a party. I don't think there's much that can be done about this. Of course, it's not a budget that has been approved yet. When the House returns in two weeks, it's just the framework that they'll be uh, looking at. And then it will go to committees, and we'll see if it uh, works its way through the committees. But it likely will, uh, probably in the late fall, maybe by Christmas. Gary, can you give us a few of the salient horror stories <laughs> that are embedded in this terrible budget? Well, Pat, one thing they want to do is expand Medicare. That was something that Sanders always wanted. His, his thumbprints are all over this uh, legislation, uh, proposed legislation. Universal pre-K, child care, community college, elder care. Of course, they've always talked about doing away with student loans. But when it comes to uh, Medicare, they want to lower the age. They want to expand it uh, to include things like eye care, dental care, so forth. And in addition to that, Pat, uh, one big thing on Sanders' list has been paid family medical leave. Now, right now, you can leave, uh, take family leave and, and go for 12 weeks, I guess, and, and still come back to the same position that you had on the job, but it's not paid. Imagine paying people for not being productive. Uh, small businesses will not be able to afford that. You combine that with increases in the minimum wage, they'll be shutting their doors. Well, uh, it looks like Bernie Sanders uh, is a socialist, actually. He spent his honeymoon in Moscow, so you really call him a communist. But it looks like the left, the so-called squad with AOC and Bernie Sanders, are pretty much running the government right now. Am I, am I right in that? Well, I, they're definitely running the Democratic Party. And just think about it. I mean, Bernie Sanders, if it hadn't been for him backing off in the primary season, Joe Biden wouldn't be president. Bernie Sanders would have run against Trump, and Trump probably would have beat him. And that, that is what the Democrats were concerned about. So I'm sure they made backroom deals saying, Bernie, look, you back off. Uh, we will uh, push through uh, much of your agenda. And part of this agenda is very radical. Climate change, Pat, is also part of that. That's a big thing for Bernie Sanders and AOC. But what can you really do about the climate? Uh, I talked to one climatologist earlier this week, and he said, look, uh, they're, they're always, uh, it's really a solution looking for a problem. And he wouldn't spend one dime on it because he doesn't think we're in a climate crisis. Gary, thank you very much. Sure. Well, in other news, going down in flames, Governor Andrew Cuomo is resigning, caving to pressure after a bombshell report accused him of sexually harassing 11 women. The governor will step down in two weeks. So who will replace him and how will she make history? CBN White House correspondent Eric Phillips has that coverage. 
Well, Cuomo said the state assembly outlined an expensive and time-consuming impeachment process involving weeks of hearings and investigations and months of litigation costing the state time and money it can't afford to spend. So, despite his first inclination to fight, he ultimately chose to resign and end the distraction. The best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. And therefore, that's what I'll do. Embattled New York Governor Andrew Cuomo resigning, effective in two weeks. The announcement coming a week after a damning state attorney general investigative report accusing him of sexually harassing 11 women. Cuomo called the report unfair and untruthful. This is about politics. The governor stepping aside and offering apologies, though not admitting to the allegations. He explained that while trying to be friendly, he inadvertently acted in a way that was too familiar. In my mind, I've never crossed the line with anyone. This is not to say that there are not 11 women who I truly offended. There are. And for that, I deeply, deeply apologize. There are generational and cultural shifts that I just didn't fully appreciate. And I should have. No excuses. Cuomo made the public announcement moments after his attorney spoke out to poke holes in the AG's report. The investigators acted as the prosecutors, the judge, and the jury of Governor Cuomo. Reaction to Cuomo's announcement was swift, even coming from President Biden himself, who was among the chorus of leaders calling for the governor to resign. I respect the governor's decision, and uh, I, uh, I respect the decision he made. New York Attorney General Letitia James said, today closes a sad chapter for all of New York, but it's an important step towards justice. And one of the governor's first accusers, Lindsey Boylan, tweeted, I am thankful for the attorney general, the investigators, and all those who have pursued the truth despite intimidation and threats of retaliation. There is absolutely no joy in any of this. It is a tragedy, just a massive, heartbreaking tragedy for so many. Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul will become the first female governor in New York state history. She released a statement saying she agrees with Governor Cuomo's decision to step down, that it's the right thing to do and in the best interest of New Yorkers. Pat. Well, let me ask you this. He really, it wasn't a question of, of how many nursing home people were put into COVID situations where they died, but he ruined the state. They've lost the uh, a member of Congress, and people are fleeing New York by the thousands. Can you, you, you have any information about the, the specifics about what's happening to New York? Well, you know, that whole situation with the nursing homes and the perhaps misinformation that was given about death there was sort of the beginning of the end where Governor Cuomo is concerned. Of course, that is outside of what we're talking about today, where these allegations of sexual harassment against these 11 women are concerned. But when you look at his legacy as a whole, that certainly was a blemish on it. And it came after he was considered one of the leading governors in terms of fighting the war on COVID-19. So again, that was sort of the beginning of the end. Now you have this situation where he's been accused of sexually harassing these 11 women. In the face of a possible impeachment, he decides to step down. And the idea is that perhaps he was trying to control the narrative. Because if, in fact, Pat, he was impeached, he would have to go immediately. There would be no 14-day buffer. So in, in doing so, resigning, he's able to control the narrative, have 14 days to kind of leave office the way that he does with his image and his uh, the way that he wants to be remembered somewhat intact. But again, when you talk about things like that whole nursing home debacle, it's an uphill climb. Eric, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I don't think any sadness would be, but oh, I've pointed out before, you've got the leader of New York, New York is in shambles because of his policies. You've got the leader of California with a uh, recall. So going into the next presidential election, the Democrats really don't have a very deep bench. And you wonder who in the world are they going to put up? And that's why they, they are attacking Governor DeSantis so hard, because he is the presumptive uh, 
uh, nominee for the Republican Party. But this is a massive shift. And as I, I said in previous programs, they know they're going to lose big in the midterm elections. They're going to lose control of the House. They're going to lose control of the Senate. They're going to lose the speakership. I mean, it's going to be a tsunami of, uh, of people who are voting against them because of crime and because of inflation and because of this uh, flood of immigrants on the border and all the other stuff that's going on. They are going to lose big and they're trying to jam everything they can through in the socialist agenda before they lose control. So keep in mind, it's, it's coming as sure as the sun rises every day. Well, also in the news, the heat is on to get the COVID vaccine. The U.S. military, along with business giants like Walmart, are mandating vaccinations as well as the Justice Department the EEOC and Veterans Affairs. Well, leery of the shot, many Americans are pushing back. So what could happen next? Jennifer Wishon has that. The latest statistics show just half of the country is fully vaccinated, and those who haven't taken the shot are facing more repercussions. In a memo to U.S. service members, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin announcing all troops will be required to get the COVID vaccine, a move supported by President Joe Biden. CNN has fired three employees who came to work without getting a COVID vaccine. CNN joins some of the nation's largest employers like Walmart, Google, and Facebook, all requiring workers to get vaccinated. Both the Justice Department and Equal Employment Opportunity Commission have decided the mandates are acceptable. Certainly, I celebrate when I see businesses deciding that they're going to mandate that for their employees. But when Veterans Affairs mandated healthcare workers get vaccinated or face possible termination, doctors, nurses, and other professionals lit up the phones at Liberty Council. Many of them have been distraught, frantic. Some have called us in tears to uh, find out how they could ultimately respond. They love their job, but they didn't want to get the shots. Liberty Council pressured the government to reveal employees can legally opt out for religious reasons, a fact that wasn't publicized. Many Americans simply aren't comfortable getting a COVID vaccine. That's because of questions regarding both long-term effects and the reporting of injuries from vaccines. Add that to confusion from the CDC about breakthrough infections and masks that's led to mistrust. And the fact that the shots are still not fully authorized by the FDA. Like it or not, getting a vaccine has also become politicized, which is something the Biden administration has worked to tamp down. Why is it that a mandate about vaccine or about wearing a mask suddenly becomes a statement of your political party? We never should have let that happen. And come on, America, we, we can separate these, can't we? We're incredibly polarized about politics. We don't really need to be polarized about a virus that's killing people. Staver argues it comes down to one thing, freedom. But it is reprehensible. It's un-American. It's unconstitutional. It's illegal to force individuals, particularly our healthcare working heroes, against their will. And that is just despicable. And today, Liberty Council is organizing Walkout Wednesday, encouraging all Americans, vaccinated or not, to walk out of their workplaces or schools at noon to stand for freedom. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Uh, I'm for freedom, folks, but I really do believe th this, this COVID is deadly. It is just a horrible thing. And I don't think we ought to make people do stuff that they are against doing, but at the same time, uh, for their own good, this you don't want to get COVID. Well, CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson is, is uh, with us now. Uh, Lori, who can opt out of these mandates? What's the process? Well, Pat, when we look at vaccine mandates among schools, for example, each state has different criteria. So we can definitely expect people can uh, opt out of COVID-19 vaccine mandates for medical reasons. That means you have a legitimate medical reason why you cannot have this vaccine. For example, you're allergic to some of the ingredients in the vaccine. Another way sometimes people are allowed to opt out of vaccine mandates is for religious reasons. This means that you are a member of a religion that forbids you to have any other kind of medical care except 
faith healing. And then the third criteria is philosophical reasons. Some people are philosophically opposed to vaccines. And in some places, they're able to opt out of vaccine mandates for, those, for that reason. Uh, the FDA is fast-tracking approval on the Pfizer vaccine. I thought it was already approved. Well, what are they doing? <laughs> right. So many people are confused by this. It has received emergency use authorization, so it is approved. But it hasn't gotten that final authorization. And studies show that some people, some people who are vaccine hesitant, are holding out until the FDA issues that final approval. And now we know that that final approval is expected for just the Pfizer vaccine probably by next month, but an internal FDA memos obtained by the Associated Press show that it's probably going to be before Labor Day. And so once that final approval comes through, it's expected that many more people will indeed get the vaccine and some organizations, government offices, businesses, schools and whatnot are more likely to adopt vaccine mandates at that time, Pat. Um, Laurie, uh, we've got all this confusion about do you wear masks, do you not wear masks, and, uh, and little kids wearing masks, do you, do you go outside and socially distance the, out, the out of doors, you got to wear a mask? You go home, you have to wear a mask. Oh, talk about all that stuff. Is it just, necessary? I know. It's just overwhelming. And yes, it's necessary because this vaccine, ha this virus has changed. It, it isn't what it was at the beginning of June when it was practically non-existent. So yes, uh, the vaccine, the, the, uh, the, the masks and where to wear them and the kids, it's just a big mess. I know here in Virginia Beach, for example, it's very typical of different school districts across the country. The school board meeting till went past it went pa till past midnight last night, and uh, the school board was very divided. But they ended up saying yes, max vaccine or rather masks are required for the kids. It's very upsetting to some people. Some people really want it right next door in Chesapeake. Uh, masks are not required. So it's often done on a very local basis and an individualized basis within businesses, within school districts regarding masks. But as we talked about before, Pat, masks are not really the, the what medical doctors say are the solution to this pandemic, it's vaccines. You know, one thing I want to point out, we've got to get on with it, but, you know, this whole social distance, this six-foot thing, as I understand it, it was a dead Italian that came up with that concept, and it really has no scientific basis. Am I correct in that? It is. And so a lot of these uh, mitigation efforts that were in place before we had vaccines are being challenged and questioned. Are they really that effective? And many people, many medical professionals are saying, no, not really. But once again, things that uh, medical doctors almost universally agree is that the best approach is vaccines. OK, well, I, I'm a, a vaccine fan. I, uh, this thing, ladies and gentlemen, is horrible. It is a horrible thing. It leads to neurological problems. It leads to problems with your heart, and you don't want to get it. So if this little vaccine will, there are side effects of the vaccine, but they, they pale uh, in insignificance in relation to the damage that that COVID thing can do, especially this new virus that is coming along. Epic drought is devastating the West. It's depleted the country's largest reservoir by two thirds and prompted the federal government's plans to declare a historic shortage. Supply cuts will follow, but the state of Nevada is well prepared, even term claiming that turning on every faucet and every shower and every hotel room on the Las Vegas Strip won't increase the amount of water depleted from the Colorado River. So how is that possible? Senior National Affairs Correspondent Heather Hill, uh, Sells is going to give us an explanation. What happens here at Lake Mead matters. Seven Western states, along with 29 tribes in Mexico, depend on the water that flows through here. The Southwest is one of the most heavily populated areas in the whole United States, so we are concerned. 40 million people rely on this giant reservoir, which today is only at one third capacity. An infamous bathtub rain tells the story. Lake water last covered the whitish minerals on the rock in the late 1990s. This is really new territory 
given that all of Las Vegas and many other cities in the Southwest have really grown during that time. So this is, this is serious. To get a better idea, take a look at the water level in these pictures at the Hoover Dam from 20 years ago and compare them to today. Those who use the lake for boating and other recreation are well aware of the shrinking shoreline. You can see the effects of the drought here at the Lake Mead Recreation Area. They've had to build new ramps just to get people and boats into the shallow lake. It's scary to think about, you know, what happens if it drops more. When I normally launch my jet ski off Boulder Beach, and there's probably about a good 12 to 20 feet of mud that you can't actually drive in, you will get stuck. The falling levels and shrinking water supply didn't happen overnight. It's the result of 20 plus years of more heat, less rain, and less runoff. What we think about droughts now is it's really a balance between that supply, that lack of rainfall, and the atmospheric thirst. How dry is that atmosphere? How much water is that atmosphere pulling out of the ground? On one side, scientists believe the West has moved beyond temporary drought towards aridification, a permanent phase of more dryness and less water. Either way, Western states like Nevada are preparing for unwelcome intervention when the federal government declares a historic shortage and water supply is reduced. You're looking at about nine billion gallons of water less uh, that will be available for our community. Southern Nevada gets 90% of its water from the reservoir. Thanks to aggressive conservation, however, the water authority here isn't panicking. The effort dates back to 2002, when the West drought began in earnest. We had to pivot very, very quickly and reduce our water use almost overnight. What that looks like, financial incentives for homeowners to remove grass and replace it with drip irrigated rockscapes. Also, limited watering schedules for these yards, complete with water police. They patrol for homes with leaks or those not following the rules. Uh, if they don't take corrective action, they could end up with a water waste fine. Even more important is what Southern Nevada does with indoor water. Get this, it recycles and reuses 100% of it. We could turn on every faucet and every shower in every hotel room on the Las Vegas Strip, and it wouldn't increase the amount of water we deplete from the Colorado River, because all of that indoor water use gets reclaimed, treated to near drinking water standards, and returned back to Lake Mead. Last year, this conservation allowed the region to use just 83 billion gallons of water, far less than its 98 billion gallon allotment. That also means enough margin to absorb the expected cuts. The work has caught the attention of neighboring states. The region is partnering with Southern California right now to repurpose its treated wastewater, which up to now has been discharged into the Pacific Ocean. Believe it or not, Las Vegas was founded in part because of its water supply, a bubbling spring that helped start the city in 1905. Today, it's got a 50-year water plan, although there's still concern for the future. Just how much water will the region have going forward, and how will it accommodate a booming population? It's why Southern Nevada is joining with other Western states to ask for up to a billion in federal dollars to help better understand the drought and manage the precious supply of water in some of the country's driest states. Reporting in Southern Nevada, Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, isn't that amazing? Sin City is going to have their own water and so we'll, we're not going to shut down one iota. Well, good for them. Hey, I, I want to mention something before we go to the next feature. Uh, when we were talking the other day about the uh, immune system of the human body, we talked about the importance of the gut, which about 80% of your immune system is in the little microbiome that controls your gut, plus a whole lot of other things that deal with your health. So uh, we have offered a book, and if thousands of people uh, called in and wanted a copy, and we'll give it to you free. So I want to mention it again. It's called Build a Better Gut, and we'll give it to you free. All you have to do is just pick up the phone, call in 1-800-700-7000, 
and get your free copy, but it'll be our pleasure because I want you to be healthy, and this is the best way of staying ahead of disease. We can't guarantee it'll beat COVID, but it sure will make you better off against almost every other pathogen that's going after you. So uh, we'll give you this book free, and thousands of people asked for it before, and I'll ask, I'll give it to you again. 1-800-700-7000. Here's Wendy. Bases are loaded or second and third, no outs. Those are the times when San Diego's Mike Melanson draws on his secret weapon. The four-time All-Star closer is currently leading the MLB in saves. So what's his go-to pitch? Mike shared that and much more with sports reporter Tom Buring in this exclusive interview. God has blessed me in so many ways and perfect weather. I think it's the best weather in the world. I'm thankful that I've had to really work hard to, to get here and my talent hasn't taken me the whole way. Along the way, San Diego Padres' Mark Melanson has played 13 seasons with eight different teams. The four-time All-Star closer enters the ninth inning to hold the lead and secure a win. People will say you're a control pitcher that uses his knowledge to know the strike zone well. That's a nice way of saying I don't throw that hard, so <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Everybody wants to throw 100 miles an hour, but I think that masks a lot of details. Unfortunately, I don't have 100 miles an hour, so I have to be better at the details. A lot of times when you have so much talent, you overlook those little things. Attention to detail provides Mark with a broader perspective, serving him in bigger challenges personally and professionally. Pandemic, what did you learn about yourself and your family? Time, time itself is so valuable. Our kids grow up so fast. I have three young ones and a year ago, you know, we started this thing and now, now we're coming out of it, but I'm so thankful in how we've gotten to grow together as opposed to being separated in our own lives. The whole time aspect is, has really hit me hard in a good way. What is your go-to pitching? Cutter curveball are my two go-to pitches. My cutter is, is basically a, a little bit offset four seam fastball. My curveball is a knuckle curve. I just rest my finger on top and pull down like a hammer. So when you're in the bullpen, as the game progresses, how do you deal with the timing mentally and the rhythm as it approaches? I have checkpoints throughout the game. I know in the third inning, I gotta have this stuff done. When it gets to the fifth, I'm, I'm in this situation. And the seventh, I know mentally, physically, I gotta be here. And then the eighth, and then I'm, I'm rolling. And you're kind of flying on standby, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Are there moments when you are out there of companionship with him in the moment of your pitching? All the time. Yeah, oh yeah. It's usually when the bases are loaded or, you know, second, third, no out. <laughs> I just have left it up to him and said, you know what, whatever happens here, I know that you're gonna be with me and I'm gonna give it all I have here, but whatever happens, I know it's gonna be for the best. Kind of the stress just goes away from you at that point. Having somebody like the Lord out there is pretty nice. So the focus finality of a closer, what's your mindset when you step on that mound? Hard to explain, but the tunnel vision that you have when you're out there is, is really cool. You can't really match it anywhere else. It truly is tunnel vision. Focus level is off the charts. It's, it's pretty unique in that way. Strike thrower, thrill seeker. That's how you're known. Walking with cheetahs, diving with great whites. So is there one that you've got in the back of your mind that's next? Ski the Swiss Alps. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that at some point. I've skydived and rode bikes down the world's most dangerous road in Bolivia. and All those things have been really thrill seeking, but I'm looking forward to spending some of these things with my kids as well as my wife. Skiing down the Swiss Alps would be a blast. Mark has reinvented himself over the course of his career, similar to the ongoing transformation of his faith. You know, just like your walk with Christ, it's changing, it's growing, it's becoming more mature. I feel like that with each team that you learn a little bit about each person and I feel like that with God, it's growing with time and the more he puts me in different situations, the more I grow with him. What's most misunderstood about the Christ mm -hmm. that we follow? That we have to do something to receive him, something external, some good deed. I feel like it's such a false narrative. I think what helped me the most is when I had kids, I, I realized that 
boy, I'm going to love them unconditionally. And I know that he only does that so much more than we do with our kids. So I can't imagine his love for us. Mark Melanson, great pitcher for the Padres and a great believer. And I love, Pat, how he talked about that mindset on the, yeah. the mound where, you know, he could just give it all over to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then that peace came and he's like, okay, now I can just have fun. That's right. this, can you imagine the pressure? It, it is a game after all. It is a game. Wonderful story. Yeah. All right. Well, it is time now for your questions and Pat's honest answers. All right, we're going to start with Charlene. Three years ago, she says, I had to have all my upper teeth removed. Unfortunately, I can't wear the dentures that were made for me. Have you ever heard of God restoring a person's teeth? That is one miracle I have never heard of. Oh, I've heard of one. Donald Don talked about the fact that he watched somebody's eyeball being recreated. Yeah. But I really don't know anybody about the other. But I, I might say you don't have to wear dentures. They do implants that are just very, very successful. And uh, so I, I really think you ought to go to your dentist and see if you can't do something about implants because they do work and they're fantastic. All right. Amen. Okay. Here's Angie's question. She says, 20 years ago, I prayed to God for the love of a married man. And at the moment, I felt the overwhelming feeling of happiness and knew God had granted my wish. After a 15-year affair, we had to go our separate ways, which was extremely painful. Although we haven't spoken for a few years, I know in both our hearts our love is still strong. Why would God give me a love so deep if it is a sin? Now, there was a song oh, that about how can something that feels so good be wrong. <laughs> Listen, what you're talking about is you and this guy are committing adultery. That's a, a, a one of the, the, the seventh commandment, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Because you are stealing some woman's husband, and you are having an affair with him, and you're saying, God gave you love. God does not promote sin. So how did God do it? I wouldn't blame God at all. You, your emotion took over. And you justified what you were doing, which is a lot of people do. They justify it and they say, well, our love is so deep. And how can something that feels so good be wrong? You know, that's what it amounts to. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. God didn't do it. All right. All right. All right. Good word. Here's Joanne. My friend says that the Bible contradicts itself. She says if, if once saved, always saved, then why do Christians have to stand before God at the judgment? Uh, the Bible doesn't say once saved, all, all saved. So that, that first of all, is a, is a doctrine of certain churches. But listen, what the Bible does say, we must all stand before the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, to give an account for what we did in our body. It isn't we're going to hell. It's just that, I mean, do you think that somebody that doesn't do anything for the Lord all his life and he stands before God, he's going to get the same deal as somebody who's been working for 50 or 60 years in the service of the Lord? They could both get the same thing. It wouldn't be fair. And so we're going to, we're going to give an account for what we did in our body. That doesn't mean we're going to hell. It just means that there's a great white throne where those who didn't come to the Lord will be cast into the lake of fire. But in the meantime, don't worry about it. And know God, the Bible doesn't contradict itself, okay? All right. Here's Steve. What does it mean in Genesis where God tells Abraham, now that I know you would not withhold your son from me, God knew that Abraham would do even... He knew what Abraham would do even before he did it. This verse makes it sound like God discovered or learned something. <laughs> God knows everything about the past, present, and future. So this passage does not make sense to me. Well, uh, I, I don't think that, you know, you know, God expresses himself in human terms. You know, for example, uh, the sun doesn't rise, which the Bible talks about the sun rising and the sun sets and so forth. The sun doesn't rise. The earth revolves around, you know, in its orbit. Um, so God is saying, I, I perceive from your actions that you wouldn't withhold you. But of course God knew in advance. Of course he knows everything. 
All right. Here's Judy's question. When I pray the Lord's Prayer, I always stumble on the part that says, lead us not into temptation. We all know that God doesn't tempt us and the tempter is Satan. So could you please tell me what this means? There's something called the Brain Scott's edition. It says, suffer us not to be sifted. And what God is, is saying in that, don't let us be sifted. And it, it doesn't mean lead us not into temptation. God's not going to lead you into temptation. But what we're praying is don't let us be sifted because we could be in trouble if we get in trouble. And that's what our prayer really is. It isn't lead us not into temptation. God, God isn't about to lead us into temptation. It's not going to happen, all right? But you know, almost every version of the Bible has it like that. Yeah. Has it lead us not into temptation? Well, right? it depends on how you translate the Greek. Yeah. Okay. All right, good all stuff. Right. Great questions today. Good yeah. answer. John and Leela Roy had just bought their first house. The only problem, it came with no appliances, and they couldn't afford to buy any. This former Marine and his wife were on a shoestring budget, and the stress was overwhelming them until they, this wonderful Marine and his wife, received a hand up from CBN's Helping the Home Front. Corporal John Roy and his wife Leela called Camp Pendleton in Southern California home when John served as a U.S. Marine. Both are proud of his service. I think part of it is the way my parents raised me. We were, I guess our family was pretty patriotic. I was always had a, kind of an attraction to that, you know, to serve my country in some way. I think it's a very honorable thing. When I see him in his uniform, it just makes me so proud of him. John transitioned out of the military to use his GI Bill to go to school. The couple knew it would be financially tight. It would take a few months for John's school benefits to kick in. Meanwhile, the couple purchased their first home and closing costs depleted their savings. The only house they could afford was one without appliances and they didn't have money to buy them. Sometimes if you get worried and I get really stressed out and I'll cry about it, John will remind me that we're partners and that I'm not alone and that we'll figure it out and that God will always provide where he leads us. If she has something that she wants to pray for, I can pray for her as well. Like we can pray together. Hey, guys, how are you doing? Pastor Dave Townsend of Faith Warrior Ministry invited the couple over to tell them CBN's helping the home front was paying their first three mortgage payments. So, what do you think? <laughs> I, I'm I speechless. Nothing. And he had another surprise. So today, we get to have an opportunity for you guys to go to Home Depot and pick out your new appliances. Definitely gonna help out a lot, Mr. Dave. He does. You know, I just appreciate you guys, and may the Lord bless you. I feel like I'm dreaming. <laughs> the couple headed to Home Depot to pick out the appliances for their new house. This newlywed couple can begin their new life together without financial strain. I'm so overwhelmed with thankfulness and gratefulness, and. Just, I feel so loved right now, and I can feel God's arms wrapped around me. God's arms wrapped around them in the person of helping the home front, because that's one of the things CBN does. We don't just have a TV show, which you watch, we're watching right now, but we reach out to the world. We're broadcasting uh, in about 59 different languages all around the world. And uh, we have, uh, we have uh, studios in various cities, but more than anything here at home, we're helping these servicemen who deserve our help, and it's called helping the home front. So that's one of the things we do. Operation Blessing, I might add, helps about 400 million people a year. 300, I'll get it right, 300 million a year. 300 million people around the world. So when you join the 700 Club, you're helping to a lot of people like John and Leela. Wonderful couple, but they just needed a hand. And so it's helping the home front. And if you want to participate, we'd like you to be one of our members of the 700 Club. $20 a month, 65 cents a day, and you can be part of, a, of an army of thousands of people who want to change this world. And when you join, I want to give you something. Uh, we have something called God is for us, the verses of salvation, peace, and victory from the book of Romans. 
And uh, this is an audio, and people seem to like it. And we send this as our gift when you begin to be a 700 Club member. You, Nancy from Greensboro, yeah. North Carolina, loves it. She says, I really enjoyed God is for us. I learned some things from Romans that I did not realize before. Thank you for the insight. Well, Nancy, thank you for letting us know. It's a blessing to you. Amen. All right. Top-notch pain. That's what landed college athlete Emmett Holt in the hospital. What was wrong with him? Doctors had no clue. But after six weeks, Emmett went into toxic shock, and then he flatlined. I've been playing basketball since I was a little kid, uh, very young, around three, four years old. That's my place of peace. Um, I feel I'm at bliss when I'm there. So the court is, in terms, my sanctuary. In the fall of 2017, junior Emmett Holt was looking forward to another great year playing for Providence College. I know it was going to be a great season. The sky was the limit for us, honestly. But one night in early September, he started experiencing intense stomach pains. An hour later, he called the team trainer. He gets there, and I'm crawling down the hallway. I'm just in pain at this point, like it's top-notch pain, some pain I never felt before. I just knew something was wrong. Emmett was rushed to Roger Williams Medical Center in Providence, Rhode Island. When the pain continued into the next morning, doctors suspected appendicitis and prepared for surgery. They also called his mother, Caroline. The first thing that I thought about after I got the message was, oh my God, what's going on? What's really going on? You know, um, I believe in prayer. So I definitely prayed. By the time she made the six hour drive, Emmett was in recovery. His appendix was fine and they couldn't find anything wrong. Seeing him laying on that bed really made me feel helpless. I just grabbed him and hugged him, you know, sitting here looking at my child in pain, tubes, medicine, IVs, all this stuff on and no one not really know what's going on. It, it's frustrating, it's aggravating. Um, cried many, many times. Just like, God, you know, what is this all about? Unable to keep food down, Emmett was put on a feeding tube. He grew weaker with each passing day, and his hopes for a great season were vanishing. I was very angry with God. Future was looking amazing. And then all of a sudden we had this huge blockade. It was really a lot of trial, error, a lot of testing, a lot of blood work, because they honestly didn't know what was going on. After two weeks of testing, doctors still had no answers. By then, Emmett had lost almost 20 pounds and was in constant pain. Frustrated, Caroline insisted Emmett be moved to Massachusetts General in Boston to see a different group of doctors. Our prayers were definitely, Lord, send someone with the wisdom and knowledge to figure out what is going on. There was plenty of nights where I yelled out to God and questioned him. As family, friends, and teammates prayed, Emmett continued to decline. Now it wasn't a matter of missing a season of basketball. It was about losing his life. I had nightmares of that. Uh, I had questions about it, questioned God about it, and. You know, and I said, God, if you're going to take him, you're going to have to prepare me for this because this is not how his story should end. Just being alone and letting my mind wander and having the devil talk to me in my ear, um, all these factors, uh, it led me to just have the mindset of if I die, I die. Then in late October, six weeks after entering the hospital, Emmett went into toxic shock and was rushed into surgery. When I first initially heard that he had flatlined, I had this cold chill go all over my body. It just threw me into so many emotions, so many feelings. I mean, I can't put a word to all of the, the feelings and emotions I had. I was just really overwhelmed. It was then they found the problem, an infection aggressively eating at his intestines. They operated on Emmett for six hours, removing eight feet of small intestine and installing an ileostomy bag for waste. Still, they weren't sure it was enough. There was no assurity. You know, there was no certainty. There was no nothing, no promises. Everyone was pretty much praying that it would go well. The next day, Emmett was weak but stable, so they moved him to ICU. By then, Emmett was sure his basketball career was over. 
Soon, Emmett started to improve. Doctors worked with his conditioning coach to help him regain the 50 pounds he'd lost and build his strength back. He was able to get out of that bed when he was able to actually eat, when he was able to actually walk around. I did feel like my prayers was being answered. As for Emmett, another change was taking place. I, I found a new relationship with God while I was in the hospital, you know? God is first on everything. In late November, after 64 days in the hospital, Emmett finally went home. He returned to college in January, and later that spring, his ileostomy was reversed. That fall, he walked out onto the court for his first home game of the season. For me to step onto the court and I look up and everyone just starts applauding because they congratulate me on my success of beating this thing, whatever this was. Um, it was just a so real feel. It was, it was amazing. I was so excited for him because the one thing he wanted back, God gave it back to him. Emmett went on to grad school and played another season until it was canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now graduated, he still has dreams of going pro, but it's not basketball that's first in his mind. Because I give glory to God everywhere I go. There's nothing impossible for God because I look at my son and he's the walking miracle. I know God has a purpose for me on this earth and I know I'm walking through it right now. I'm blessed to be able to do such. I'm just excited to see what comes next. And we're excited for you. Wow, that was a true miracle. And Pat, you know, I'm just amazed because he was in the hospital over 60 days. Yeah. And you know, sometimes the Lord doesn't heal us right away, does he? Exactly. But he does do it. Well, in that case, he did. I mean, it was, you know, God uses doctors. I think we better recognize it. Yeah. In Emma's case, he, he answered prayer by providing a doctor that found the cause of his problem. Hey, we've got some dramatic answers that took place almost instantaneously. <clears throat> and here's Carla, who sent an email, said, Carla said, I injured my knee going down a set of stairs. My doctor thought it was a pulled ligament. It was very painful, hard to walk. We watched the 700 Club every day. And last month, Wendy had a word of knowledge about a knee. I immediately said, that's me. And from then on, I've had no pain and walk normally. Praise the Lord. Here's one. Pat, uh, you had a word of knowledge for, uh, or Gail said by email, Pat had a word of knowledge for our family today. My husband's vocal cords were damaged in surgery earlier this summer. He's a high school coach and teacher that needs his voice. Praise God. As soon as he opened his mouth, his voice was as clear as a bell and back to normal. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, we want to pray for you folks. God is no respecter of persons, and he loves you. Now, we're going to join hands, and we're going to believe God, Father, in Jesus' name. We praise and magnify you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. And with you, all things are possible, Lord. You said, hitherto we've asked nothing. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy might be full. So we ask now, in the name of Jesus, Somebody's lungs are filling with fluid. Jesus. Is it Michael Norman Woods? Is it, the lungs are filling. And God is just, put your hand on your chest in the name of Jesus. Touch him, Wendy. There's a man, Tony is your name, and you suffer from diabetes, and it's your feet that are being affected. And God is saying to you today, I'm giving you new feet. So whatever that means to you, take it. Thank God you. is healing you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you. Lord, in the name of the Lord, we pray for this nation. Yes. Lord, this country is under attack. The, the forces of evil are trying to destroy this nation. And you, Lord, this is still the last hope of the world. We're not worthy of your blessing, but we ask yes. that you might make us worthy of the blessing of God. Deal with this country and let your blessing come upon it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of Mark. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Tomorrow, meet the woman who made history in the NFL draft. You'll find that very interesting. For Wendy and all of us, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.